Thank you, Carolyn. If you will add to the prayer list, please, uh, Jerry and Luetta Green. Uh, late in the week, we got word that their grandson in Michigan had taken his own life, a uh, brother of little Kara Andrews, and so they are headed up there at this time, so please remember them. Uh, Philip, have you, were you able to fish off my, my JPEG there? This is Benajia Harvey Carroll. And his portrait can be, this portrait here can be found in the rotunda at the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, there are large portraits in the rotunda around the whole round area there of all the seminary presidents, both past and present. But this is the most prominent uh, because uh, B.H. Carroll was the founder and first president of, of Southwestern Semina Seminary. He was a longtime pastor at First Baptist uh, Waco around the, the turn of the century. He had been a, a soldier in the Civil War, and he was a larger-than-life character who was probably the most prominent person in Southern Baptist life at the turn of the 20th century. Now, history tells us that although uh, Dr. Carroll was a teetotaler and he shunned alcohol, he did have a fondness for firearms and fine cigars. <laughs> and a long time, any good seminary student can tell you, there's a long time legend that has it that when he posed for this portrait, he had in his left hand his stogie. And you see it, his left hand looks kind of funny on the portrait here. Well, the legend was that, uh, that certain uh, uh, socially responsible Baptists felt that the picture conveyed the wrong image, and they had the offending cigar painted over and a pocket added so that it would look like he had his hand in his pocket. I don't know whether or not you were offended at the idea of a minister enjoying a good smoke, but Charles Haddon Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, loved fine cigars, much to the consternation of his parishioners. And he was once approached by a young man who, who said, I've been given a box of these cigars, and I don't know what to do with it. How should I dispose of them? And Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, uh, give them to me, and I shall smoke them to the glory of God. Uh, also, story has it that Dwight Lyman Moody once got to spend some time with Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Can you imagine being in that meeting? Two of the greatest preachers of all time. And, and, uh, and D.L. Moody says, when are you going to get rid of those awful cigars? To which uh, Spurgeon poked him in his very ample belly button and said, as soon as you get rid of that. Aren't you wondering what this has to do with Romans chapter 14? <laughs> <laughs> Turn to Romans chapter 14, if you will. Now, for those who are, are graciously sitting in with us today while we destroyed your, your own classes, let me kind of tell you, give you a little background to where we've been. Romans, as you undoubtedly know, is so rich in theological significance, and we've been studying some pretty weight, weighty theological issues, including the Roman road. Uh, the, the, the best example I know of of sharing salvation with someone uh, and, but he does finally get to a point, Paul does, where he says, okay, we've talked about theory. What about practice? What does this mean to me? How do I put this into, into my daily life? And so now in, uh, in Romans chapter 14, we're going to embark on something just a little bit different. And he's going to talk, as your notes probably say here, about the weak and the strong. Now, just almost out of nowhere, and that's what's led some expositors to think that perhaps Paul didn't actually write this. I disagree uh, completely because it does fit in very well with the rest of the scripture. He says this, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Now therein, my friends, lies the rub. What are disputable matters and what are not disputable matters? And I'm going to kind of close the lesson today talking about that because that's very important for us too. Here's what he says. He says, pick a hill to die on. If you're going to, make, if you're going to have an argument, don't make, it about, don't make it about something that doesn't make any difference, like the color of the carpet. You know, like what we're going to serve for the Wednesday night meal. You know, and I've seen horrible arguments in the past about things just as important as that. But he says, look, except someone whose faith is weak. Now, what does he mean about someone whose faith is weak? 
uh, because he's almost implying by that that his faith is strong. Certainly, I believe it is. I, th I think you would agree with that. But here's how he explains it. One's man, one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now, I tend to agree with that. <laughs> My vegetarian wife over here is going, your faith is weak, honey. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I've got to recover from this somehow. <laughs> Here's what he's talking about. Um, and, and let me kind of give you a little bit of background, particularly since we've already studied 1 Corinthians. And if you recall, in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, one of the things that he addresses head on is the fact that there had arisen factions within the church at Corinth. And they were boasting about it. One said, well, I am of Apollos. And the other says, well, I am of Cephas or Simon Peter. Another says, I am of Paul. And the others get up on their, raise up on their hind legs and says, well, we are of Christ. Uh, meaning, of course, they were somehow morally superior. And Paul really wagged his finger at him and says, you don't do that. We are all baptized into the same spirit. Now, apparently, something like that, but to a probably lesser degree, was going on at the church at Rome. He didn't know the church at Rome. He'd never been there. But he'd received word that perhaps that there were people who were looking down on others because of their religious practices. And we don't know for sure, but it is, we just kind of assume that one of the things that happened is that there was so much idol worship going on in Rome that, that there were some who said, look, you, we can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Paul had gone to great lengths to talk about that earlier. Uh, and they said, we're not going to eat meat sacrificed to idols, and we don't even want to eat meat that might have been sacrificed to idols. And when you buy it in the market, you don't know if it's been sacrificed to idols, so we are better to just eat vegetables. After all, we have an example in Daniel. Okay? We have an example in the, in the three Hebrew boys, you know, and, and so we find out, okay, it's not bad eating vegetables because they, they thrived on vegetables. Uh, we're probably all better off if that's all we ate was, was vegetables. But they were making this a part of their religious practices and saying, well, I am somehow morally superior to you because I'm only eating vegetables and I'm avoiding even the, the appearance of eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. What's the problem with that? Paul's already discussed the fact that meat sacrificed to idols is meat. There's nothing to it. It's meat. And that you are free to eat that. Recall the vision that Peter was given when the, the, the sheet was, was dropped down from heaven and all types of food was on it. And, and Peter, like any good Jew would have done, says, well, I'm not eating that. And, and God told him in a vision, says, you'll do what I say to. If, if I say it's clean, it's clean. And so we've gotten that settled, but for good Jews, okay, the, the Jews who, who had been, and the Jews who had been converted, which much of the early church was, they would have still had this revulsion for meat that had been sacrificed to idols, and undoubtedly would have shared that with some of those Gentiles who were in the church. Here's something interesting to me. The church at, at Rome couldn't have been more than 20, 25 years old at this time. Stop and think. Because uh, undoubtedly it was the diaspora, it was the people who were driven out of Jerusalem after the time of Pentecost or after the stoning of Stephen would have likely got, returned to Rome and would have established the church at that time. So we're no more than 20, 25 years out. And already they had established rituals in there, in the church. And you think, well, they're established over hundreds and hundreds of years, just took them 20, 25. They had already established some rituals. So he said, look, don't look down upon your friend whose faith is weak because he thinks that somehow eating vegetables is going to make him a better believer. Now, what's he saying about that believer? He's saying, well, your faith is just a little bit weaker than it should be because you're adding something to Jesus. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but, but when you boil down Paul's gospel, I think you, you don't have to look much further than Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So here's the gospel, Jesus. And I get a little weary when I start hearing Jesus and. 
Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? Jesus and gets a little bit scary because people are starting to add qualifiers there. So what these people had done is said, okay, Jesus and, don't eat that meat. That makes their faith weak. But what he's saying to those who had a proper perspective on the meat issue, let's just pick one issue, is saying, okay, be gentle with them. Their faith may, may be a little bit weaker, but don't pass judgment on them. It's amazing how many times in Scripture, not just Jesus, who certainly said it first and foremost, that we shouldn't judge. We shouldn't judge. It's not our job to do that. He says, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. That's me, the man who eats everything. I'm, I'm an omnivore. Uh, and, and, but in this particular case, he's talking about, look, we have religious freedom to eat this. You shouldn't look at, at this person who is kind of bound to his dietary restrictions as though he's somehow weak in the faith. You're not, not really supposed to look down on them. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. So if you want to say, I'm righteous in the fact that I just eat vegetables and I don't eat that old nasty meat because it might have been sacrificed to an idol, you, on the other hand, Stuart, are a heathen because I saw you munching down on that hamburger. <laughs> now, your diet's probably better than anybody else in here. I shouldn't have picked up you as the example. But you see what I'm talking about? The two can look at each other and judge and saying, well, my practices are, are somehow superior to yours. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand for the Lord is able to stand. Is able to make him stand. So look what he's saying. He has had a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Now whether he adds or subtracts to that, uh, you know, may not be completely according to the gospel. But God's going to deal with that. God's going to make him stand or not. You don't need to worry about that. That's what my mother used to say to me when I went and ratted out my sisters. Did you know what she's doing? She says, let me worry about that. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Now look what they're talking about here. Not necessarily the Sabbath, although you could certainly apply that to that. But, you know, we have some awful fights today between religious groups over what the Sabbath is. And in most of those arguments, did you know we're wrong? Because the Sabbath is still Saturday. We observe it on Sunday, but the Sabbath is still Saturday. But that's the problem. The argument is not the point. And apparently there were others who were still observing the religious holidays of the Jews. Uh, they, they were observing uh, the Feast of Pass. They were observing Passover, the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And so he was saying, look, it's okay if you do that. But don't hang your faith on it, and your salvation is not assured because you observe it. And those of you who observe it, don't look down on those who do. And those of you who don't, don't laugh at those who do. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Here's the problem. Too often when we regard one day as special or we pick one kind of diet, we're doing it because men see us. He says, you clear your conscience before the Lord, and if you wish to observe that day, that's fine. But don't do it just so men see you. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to the Lord. So you see what he's talking about here? He's saying, I'm not going to question your motives because only two people know them, you and the Lord. So as long as you're doing it to the Lord, neither person, neither party has the right to, to put down the other. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die... We belong to the Lord. One thing that I like and has stuck in my mind for a long time now is Dan has, has used this before. He says, the main thing is that we keep the main thing the main thing. And you stop and think about that. What is the main thing? Jesus. Period. Remember what I always tell the little kids up here? When you come up here and you sit down for the children's sermon and the pastor asks you any question, just always say Jesus. 
Doesn't matter, even if it's what you have for breakfast this morning. You can't go wrong with answering Jesus. Because that's keeping the main thing the main thing. We can dress it all up in other ways, but what do we have in common? Keeping the main thing. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Let me stop right there. You'd be amazed at how many times I talk to believers who don't understand that one of these days, even as believers, we will stand before the judgment seat. Did you know that? I mean, does that click with you? Forget this uh, secular idea that one day we're all going to file in this long file before St. Peter and he's going to let you in the golden gate. Uh, unless you have to stop and have another cigarette, of course. Uh, forget that, that nonsense because, because there will be a number of judgments, but one judgment that will certainly take place is for believers. Wait a minute, you mean I'm not done yet? No, you are not. Because you're going to have to stand before God and answer to Him for what you've done with the spiritual gifts that He has given you. He's, he's not going to change His mind and say, well, you know what, the scales are just a little heavier here, so uh, you're going off here with the goats. You don't get to go in with the sheep. He's not going to do that, but we are going to have to, to be held accountable for what we've done. So He reminds us of that here. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, look what he's saying, we're going to one day be accountable to God. And the next statement he's going to say, so keeping that in mind. So therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Let me tell you, we've lost sight of that, I think. I really do. Because if there's one thing that society today teaches us, and yes, it teaches us, even though we shouldn't be part of it, it's that you're number one. You are number one. You're precious. You're it. Or as they used to say, all that in a bag of chips, you are something else. The whole universe rotates right around your little pointed head. And when we, ex when we adopt that kind of idea, what, what follows then is first we judge, and second is that we lose this concept, this completely biblical concept of you first. This comes from a Savior who, gets to, who comes down from heaven and not only becomes one of us, he washes the feet of the people who are supposed to be serving him. You first. Instead, we worry about the speck in our brother's eye while completely ignoring the log in our own. Jesus put that in such a beautiful manner to illustrate it. And he says, once again, judge not. Yes, you be judged. And look what Paul is saying. Don't judge. And what, here's something else. You don't, want be, you don't want to be an obstacle to your brother. He's going to explain that in a minute, but let me tell you how that plays out. If you do have a brother who only eats vegetables, who's firmly convinced that he has it right with God, that... Uh, that you're going to, that, you know, I cannot eat meat that's sacrificed to idols. So just to avoid that, I'm going to eat vegetables. And if you invite him over to your house and you grill out hamburgers, you are an obstacle. You are a stumbling block to him. You know that that offends him. Now, what do we say in America today? It's my house, my menu. If you don't like it, bring a brown bag of vegetables. That's what we say today. What does Paul say is scriptural? Don't be a stumbling block. I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for, it, for him it is unclean. If your brother's distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. What's the problem with that? It means that we don't get our way. What's the problem with that? I'm entitled to my way. I'm special. I want to get, I want to get my way. But what's Paul saying? You first. And that just grates on us sometimes because he's the weak brother. 
Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Wow. That's sobering. Did Christ die for me too? Well, shouldn't he just learn to eat meat? He says, no. Understand, you are, you are fine in your conviction that you're allowed to eat meat, but don't ruin his party for it. If, if, that, if it means giving up meat, you give up meat. For the kingdom of God is not a matter, excuse me, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. In other words, if we're going to fight, if something is going to divide us, it's not going to be something like this. Because we've not been given that spirit. We've been given a spirit of peace and joy and righteousness. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Isn't that interesting? And you know what? It sounds so petty here. It sounds so small when he says it. Don't destroy God's work for the sake of food. For goodness sake, don't wreck a man's conscience over a corny dog. It just sounds that petty, but it's huge because Christ died for us. It is wrong for anyone to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. And I, the, we hear the word stumbling block a lot in Scripture. You don't hardly ever hear it out of Scripture because we don't like the concept. But I'll give you an example. Um, I've got to tell you, you would be hard-pressed to show me Scriptures that say, I'm not allowed to drink alcohol. You're not going to find it. I'll overwhelm you with Scriptures that show that I can. I have every right to drink alcohol. You would be in a tizzy if I did. Oh, come on, confess. <laughs> That's why I love shopping at HEB. I wheel my little cart, and as I go by the, the wine aisle, it's just like a cubby of quail. My doctor keeps telling me, you ought to have a glass of wine every night. And, uh, and I say, no, can't do it. Can't do it. Hey, I'm okay if you do. Dan won't say that. Um, he, he and I don't, don't particularly see eye to eye on that particular. I don't think Scripture uh, tells us you can't. That's, 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 liber that's religious liberty. I think it's probably best if nobody drinks. I do. But I can't because if I do, it's a stumbling block. And it doesn't matter where, I, it, let me tell you, if I sneaked into my closet, hid behind my clothes, and, and uncorked the bottle back there, someone would see me. <laughs> and I know God would, but I mean, one of you would be there. I know it. And I have to, have to tell you one way that I learned that the, the, the hard way is that I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mike, I don't know if you remember this. We were there in Santa Fe, and we were walking out of the, the ice cream shop, and I was eating my ice cream, and someone says, Mr. Phelps! And I thought, oh, God has caught a diabetic eating ice cream. <laughs> and, and it was Lisa Burkett and her family. Remember that? We're on a balcony eating at a restaurant in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and happened to see me walk out in the street with some ice cream. And I thought, well, man, I'm glad it wasn't a margarita, you know? <laughs> and so, listen, it's a stumbling block. I'm okay with that. I'm not whining about it. I don't need alcohol, but I'm just saying I don't, I, and I steadfastly refuse it. It's just it's part of who I am. It's part of what I do because I cannot be a stumbling block. Oh, I'm not holding myself up as the best example because I do other things that are stumbling blocks sometimes. Uh, and I pray that God won't, uh, he will slap me in the side of the head and say, don't do something if it offends your brother. Because we can't do anything that causes the brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. 
That's kind of interesting, isn't it? You make sure you're right in your own mind, and then you make sure that you're not serving as a stumbling block to your brother. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So he's saying, okay, if you think it's right just to eat vegetables, I'm okay with that if you, if you are firm in that with God, but if you're doing it for show, that's sin, and it's becoming between you and God. Let me tell you where I think the key is here, though. It's in verse 19. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. The great Methodist missionary, uh, E. Stanley Jones, uh, was quite a pastor, quite a missionary. Uh, he once said, talk about what you believe and you will inevitably have disunity. Talk about who you believe, and you will always have unity. Think about that. Think about that. And I think about when, when churches start to go off the tracks, when they don't make the main thing the main thing, what happens? Little stuff becomes a stumbling block, and people judge one another. We have the, the first, uh, uh, I'm, uh, my diet is superior to your diet church, and then we've got the first uh, uh, cigar-smoking church over here, and, and they, they, they both take a, a moral stand on something they've got no reason to take a stand about, and then they fight. So here's what, what I've adopted. I, you know that I have been vocal critics of the... Um, Name it and claim it, preachers, for example. And, and you wonder, well, wait a minute, why is he hard, so hard on Joel Osteen? Uh, and I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I, I try to, a, a, a phrase that Dan used today, soteriology. Uh, I, call, I call it uh, matters salvific, matters regarding salvation. You and I are brothers regarding matters of salvation. As long as we agree on this. You have a Catholic background, okay? We believe that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that, that God has risen from the dead, we'll be saved. We believe in that. We're brothers. I don't agree with some of the teachings of your church. I'm just fine. Your church doesn't, believe with, doesn't agree with some of my teachings. I'm fine with that, but here's what we can agree on is that what unites us is ever so much powerful than that which should divide us. And when you allow yourselves to focus in on that which divides you, then you're defeated already and Satan is laughing. I guarantee you, sometimes, the one time I can feel Satan's presence in the past was always in, in business meetings. <laughs> <laughs> because because it, it, nothing, nothing is more disgraceful than having two believers argue about something that really shouldn't be important. Because who gains the victory there? Yeah. Um, I learned, really, when I was in my late teens, that both my parents had been divorced previously and then married and started this family. And... Uh, I never saw them that it wasn't pretty obvious that they were in love, and I never saw them fight, ever, like in my whole life. Never saw them fight, and I asked them about it one time, and they said, you know what, we, we, we made a covenant when we got married that we weren't going to let things, uh, things that, shouldn't, that shouldn't rip us apart rip us apart. The main thing is whatever happened is that we still love one another and, and our relationship with one another and with the Lord was going to remain the focus of our lives. And until the day he died of cancer, my dad was holding my mother's hand. What a lesson, what a legacy I learned from that. And so although there may be things that divide us, your church and me, I'm not going to let that divide us in our united front to the world. Because there is one Christ, there is one Lord. Now, when you are a church or a preacher who changes the gospel, now I'm talking matter, salvific, matter salvific here, and say, okay, salvation is through Jesus and 
then I say, uh, because what does Paul say in the first chapter of Galatians? If anyone preaches a gospel other than that which I brought to you, may he be damned. Well, does that sound to you like Paul's cozying up to them? Not at all. He's saying, look, let's get this straight. Let's talk about our gospel and let's agree on what the gospel is. And as long as it's not Jesus and or something instead of Jesus, then I'm okay. And when you preach a gospel that diverts people away from the true gospel, then you be damned. It's not me. That's Paul. The, the problem is what you eat does not divert people away from the gospel. The color of the carpet, uh, the ritual. There are rituals that go on in, in, in the Catholic church that I'm unfamiliar and uncomfortable with. No doubt uh, many Catholics would come in here be completely uncomfortable. Uh, I, I call churches of Christ uh, my brothers. They may not call me brother. Uh, I call them brothers because we believe that same uniting principle. What Paul was saying is don't let the little stuff tear you apart. And don't judge your brother because you think that he's weak because of his beliefs. Now, as we like to do at the end of every lesson, let's kind of tie it all together and say, well, boy, I'm glad that was back in biblical times and we are so much more mature than that these days. Dan mentioned from the, from the pulpit this morning, one thing that, I, that always floors me is when I look at Camp Crestview and, and I watch that seething mass of humanity going on, uh, particularly in the mornings, I am firmly convinced at that point that there's no way that we did it. If you've been here, you know what I'm talking about. We can't do that. We just can't do it. Only God can do it. And so what he's done is he's taken our army from 32,000 down to 300 to prove that it has to be done only through him. And I see what can be accomplished by 350, 400 people united behind the main thing and think, isn't that a picture of biblical church? And where you, when you're all united, the differences kind of fall apart. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be so busy in worship and serving him and keeping the main thing the main thing, we don't have time to quarrel about whether you're eating vegetables or you're eating corny dogs. So I want to do just like my parents did. I'm going to say going in, you know what? I am not going to allow the evil one to put a wedge between me and other brothers. And I hope that's your prayer, too, that we say, you know what, we're going to keep the main thing the main thing here. And we don't have time for the other nonsense because we have confessed with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. And we do believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we have a chance to gather together and study your word. And, Father, that it blooms in our lives, that it's just as relevant today as it was the day that you inspired through your Holy Spirit, the apostle, to put it on paper. Father, I want to say a special prayer today about Camp Crestview, that, that not only would you give us strength, that you would give us wisdom, that we would be the type of uh, uh, ambassadors you desire, but that your Holy Spirit move in the classrooms and on the playground and, and everywhere these young children congregate, Father, and that they come to know you as Savior. Now, as we go our own ways today, help us to remember, Father, that we are people sharing Jesus, and we do it in your name. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.